Welcome to City Club. City Club is premier, Portland's premier citizen for, forum. I'm Don Williams, the president-elect of the club. The next Friday forum is November 3rd, and the topic is campaign finance reform. Our measures 46 and 47 right for Oregon. Spokespersons will be Dan Meek and Damiana Merriweather. Today, we officially kick off City Club's third annual community scan. Please take the opportunity to fill out the yellow cards that will be found either at your table or in the back of the room. City Club uses your input on this survey to guide its focus over the next year and to help plan programming that reflects the interests of the community. The community scan survey can also be found on the City Club website. All responses should be returned by November 13th. Today, beginning at 4.30, you're invited to a party, and it's not a Halloween party. It is the final Friday ballot measure party, and everyone is invited to stop by the City Club Forum at 901 Southwest Washington between 4.30 and 6. Final Friday members from City Club's research committees will be on hand to answer questions regarding the various ballot measure studies. Copies of these reports will also be available at the party. This event is free, open to the public, and reservations are not required. Costumes are optional. On Monday, October 30th, citizens, the City Club Citizens Read Book Discussion Group will be meeting to discuss this month's selection, Inherit the Win. Copies of the book can be purchased at the back of the room or at the City Club office. 10% of the proceeds from these sales go to benefit City Club. Both events, again, are free and open to the public, although we ask you to contact the City Club and make an RSVP um, before the, the event. City Club has been growing recently, and we have a number of new members. I'm going to ask you to welcome the new members. I would ask you to hold your applause until the end and would ask these people to stand as they are introduced. Ron Borkin, Andrew Schmack, Brian Steensma, Sue Horn Kasky, Cassandra Mick, and Laura Williams. I'm proud of that last one. We're very privileged to have two corporate sponsors this quarter. These contributions play an important part in continuing City Club programs. And please join me in thanking Baron Liebman, LLP, and the Zimmer Gunsel Frasca Partnership. <laughs> Energy, transportation. These are two topics of vital importance, not only to local, state, and national decision makers, but to every person in this room on a daily basis. For example, if one counts the annual addresses by the mayor of Portland and the governor, City Club has had seven Friday forums where these topics have been a major focus in 2006. The last one, the most recent one, on July 28th was entitled new developments in biomass, ocean wave, and nuclear energy, and drew a large and enthusiastic audience. Proposed solutions to the energy crisis abound. Thomas Friedman, in a recent New York Times column, strongly urged Governor Schwarzenegger to endorse California Proposition 87. Friedman asserts that passage of this measure would make California the American hub for developing clean power technologies. By taxing oil companies between 1.5 and 6% on oil production, the tax would end in 2017 or when it generated $4 billion, whichever came first. Friedman states that California, by passage of this measure, California voters could set a compelling example not only for other states, but possibly even Washington, D.C. Venture capital investments in the alternative energy sector have doubled since this time last year. Even in Iowa, farmers and local investors have raised $35 million to build a distillery that last year began turning corn into motor fuel. 
More than 140 ethanol plants are either now operating or under construction in the United States, and the building boom even hit the Pacific Northwest, where plants being erected in Klatskanai and Boardman will be fed by trainloads of Midwestern corn. These ventures signal a convergence of two key factors in the American economy, food and fuel, tech fuel industries. We're therefore very fortunate this afternoon to have as our speaker, John Hoffmeister, president of Shell Oil Company. When testifying before the U.S. Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources late in 19, excuse me, late in 2005, Mr. Hoffmeister said, my primary message is that we face fundamental and pressing energy challenge. There's no soft option and no soft landing. Every route forward has significant economic, environmental, and techno technological challenges. John was named president of Houston-based Shell Oil in March 2005. Shell is an affiliate of the Shell Group, which operates in 140 countries around the world and employs more than 112,000 people worldwide and 22,000 people in the United States. More than 75% of Americans live within five miles of one of the 17,500 Shell retail outlets, which include Jiffy Loop facilities. After receiving both his undergraduate and graduate degrees from Kansas State University, he has held key positions at General Electric, Nortel, and Allied Signal Corporations. He has lived and worked in North America, Europe, and Asia. John and his wife have interesting dinner conversations because she is an author and has a worldwide consulting practice in executive development. He has two adult daughters, and, an and his interests include the preservation of an 18th century rolling mill that he told me just uh, was an initially built in 1842 that they're restoring, and an adjacent farm in the heart of Pennsylvania's Amish country. Please join me in welcoming John Hoffmeister. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here in Portland and to discuss this very important subject of energy security. Shell is quite interested in having a national dialogue on energy security as we move into the future. The ease with which we all lived the last 50 years enjoying affordable, available energy is shifting. And whether it's experts such as Thomas Friedman, or business people like myself, or national leadership, whether in the White House or the Congress, or in the, in, in the state houses of this country, there are multiple views on energy as we go forward in this next 50 years. But the next 50 years cannot be like the last 50 years. And I think about, well, why am I here today? I'm representing a company, which obviously I'm very proud of, but some would say that you are from an industry that has zero credibility. We make and sell a product that you would not like to see, touch, taste, or smell. I knock on the doors of both houses and both parties in Congress asking permission to drill offshore continental shelf, irritating everyone I talk to. We're trying to develop new frameworks for siting liquefied natural gas terminals to try to augment the natural gas supply of this country, which everyone agrees in principle is a good thing, but except not in my backyard, please. We promote energy efficiency and conservation, which, if we are successful, will take 20 or 30 years to have an impact. And we talk about alternative energies, which we are involved in and spending heavily, which, if successful, over the next 20 years may reach 10 or perhaps as high as 20 percent of our fuel source. So why am I here talking about this? These are not pretty discussions to have. I'm really here for two reasons. 
I'm here representing a brand, a Shell brand, that has been in this country working successfully for nearly 100 years. And behind that brand are the tens of thousands of people who work for Shell, but the hundreds of thousands of people who earn their livelihoods selling products at retail to consumers across the country. Some six million people today will come to a Shell station or a Jiffy Lube, and we want them to have as positive exper an experience as they can because, ladies and gentlemen, energy and energy security underpins not only our economy, but it underpins our way of life. You are as close to energy as to a light switch or as to the tank of gas in your car. And so we have been through 12 months of agony in this country. Actually, more than 12 months, but we remember it as 12 months because the hurricanes of 2005 brought forward what is truly a crisis of the demand-supply relationship for oil and gas and other energy in this country. The hurricanes of 2005 came within 24 hours of creating panic buying up and down the east coast of America. I called Energy Secretary Bodman on the Friday evening after Hurricane Rita ripped through East Texas and West Louisiana where we had shut down all the rest of the Gulf Coast refineries that were not already shut down for Katrina, which was a month earlier. And I called him to say, Secretary, over the weekend, we're going to be working 24-7 to get the emergency generators connected to our pumps at the Motiva refinery in Port Arthur, Texas, because our supply people have said, this refinery has the last 300,000 barrels of available finished product to dump into the plantation and colonial pipelines, which feed the whole southeast of the US with gasoline products all the way up to Washington, Baltimore area. And I said, Secretary, if we don't dump these barrels this weekend, on Monday, I'm going to call you back and ask you to please ask the President if we couldn't have a day of national reflection where nobody drives, because otherwise we'll have panic buying starting in Mobile, Alabama and moving all the way up the East Coast to Washington, D.C. Now, I disturbed him at his daughter's rehearsal dinner, which is not a great time to get a call like this. And he said, John, do your best and I'll pray for you but don't call Monday, please. And I didn't, because the folks worked 24-7, and on Sunday afternoon, we dumped barrels to keep the pipeline full, which then avoided the panic buying. That's just an illustration of how tight the demand-supply relationship has become in our country, because we like to use oil and gas. Now, that led to the crisis we've faced with high prices and high profits. High profits due to the crude oil and the rise in the price of crude oil, which is much greater than the cost of crude oil as it is produced. But the prices are set on a global auction market where the Chinese, the Indians, the Europeans, the South Americans, and the Americans, North Americans, are all vying for this global supply of crude oil. And it's a 24-hour-a-day market. We're currently bargaining for oil in, in the New York Mercantile Exchange. As that exchange closes this evening, Singapore will pick it up, Dubai will pick it up, and then London will pick it up. And yes, there's after-hours trading as well as there is on-hours trading. So there is a continuous 24-hour-a-day trading market out there which sets the price of crude oil, some of which is impacted not just by the availability of crude and the demand for that crude, but also by geopolitical tensions that might exist 
in an unstable part of the world that produces a lot of oil. Or, like in any commodity trading, there are people who speculate and who buy and sell lots of oil, uh, which may or may not be holding oil that could be made available to the market. So there's all kinds of reasons why that crude price moves around the way it does. But the good news is there is sufficient crude for the world. But the bad news is in the United States, we have become dependent on that foreign crude up to 60% of our daily supply. More than 10 million barrels a day of crude is brought into this country from afar. While we are not developing crude resources in this country. Hence my knocking on the door in Congress saying, please can we have access to federal lands or to the outer continental shelf, such as the Gulf of Mexico or such as the Beaufort Sea or the Chukchi Sea in Alaska, where we believe there are prolific reserves of oil, which can help the American security front and we could be less reliant on international imports. Now, Shell believes that there is a lot of oil still out there. We know where it is. We would like the access to get it. But if we had the access, is that enough to take care of energy security? No, Shell thinks not. Access to conventional oil and gas, what we in the industry consider easy oil and gas, is probably at or has reached its peak. But yet there is another form of oil and gas called unconventional. Unconventional oil has hardly begun to be tapped. And in the Alberta, Canada oil sands region, or in the oil shale region of Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah, or in the heavy oil region of Venezuela, those three basins combined represent much more than three trillion barrels of available oil and gas where the technology has moved forward, and the technology has moved forward to the point that it is an affordable development, such as we're seeing today in Alberta, where Shell Canada will produce some 150,000 barrels of oil today, and the rest of the industry will produce up to around a half a million barrels today. The technology that's been developed for the oil shale of Colorado, an in situ oil shale development research project that Shell has been working on for nearly 20 years is reaching its natural conclusion and hopefully will demonstrate that we can affordably produce oil from oil shale, not by mining it, not by digging huge quarries, which would upset the entire western uh, slope of the Rocky Mountains with these big quarries and retort heating methods, but rather an in situ method where we drill a hole, we put a heating rod, heating element into the ground, and we heat the oil in the rock until it comes out as oil and gas. We're working on that and hope that that decision can be made sometime towards the end of this decade or early next to move forward on a commercial level. And the same in Venezuela, using a similar type of in situ technology where heat is applied to loosen up. So we are not running out of unconventional oil and gas, but even if we were to develop that, do we think that is enough to meet the energy needs of tomorrow? Shell thinks not. We, I mentioned the LNG sites earlier. We have become dependent in this country on natural gas for electricity generation and for many other agricultural and processing and home heating purposes. In fact, there are some 60 million Americans who heat their homes with natural gas. And we are running into a serious supply crunch on natural gas, where the demand and the supply curves looking out over the next 10 years suggest that there will not be a sufficient supply of natural gas from conventional natural gas production or unconventional oil and gas production to meet the demand. We could, however, bring LNG to this country, liquefied natural gas, which is a liquid form of natural gas, which is created by cooling natural gas to some minus 260 degrees centigrade, very cold product, that is then shipped and regasified at regas terminals 
along the nation's coast. Shell is actually well positioned today where we have regas uh, terminals, one in Elba Island, uh, South Carolina, and another Cove Point, Maryland. We're proposing two more sites in the United States, but in addition, Shell has worked with Sempra in Baja, California, in the Mexico side, on, and also Altamira, Mexico, to develop LNG sites in this country. There are other sites proposed, but every site that is proposed runs into opposition. We understand opposition. We live in a democracy, and opposition needs to be dealt with, and we will deal with it responsibly. And in the end, if we can't get the permits through the democratic process, we will not build the sites. But we believe that will shortchange America because it does need more natural gas. If we are successful, is that enough? Shell doesn't think so, not quite yet. There is another technology that is emerging around the world and being utilized around the world called integrated gas combined cycle electricity production. It's more simply called clean coal. Now you may say, how in the world can you ever have clean coal? Coal by nature is a dirty fossil fuel, some would say. Well, we believe that the gasification of coal, both for electricity power production, through a gasification technology, it is possible to more efficiently burn or gasify those coal molecules in which syngas is derived, in which that syngas, synthetic gas, can then be used to power gas turbines. And in the technical design of the gasifier, there are ways in which we can also capture the emissions that would otherwise go into the atmosphere and do something with them. For example, we can capture the CO2 and possibly sequester it underground or undersea. We could capture the CO2 and pump it into existing conventional oil fields which could repressurize oil fields to produce more oil. In Australia, Shell is working with a utility in Queensland on a greenfield coal gasification, IGCC, power generation facility, which will produce more than 200 megawatts of electricity with 99.8% CO2 output. That's remarkable. It's doable. The CO2 will be sequestered in abandoned coal mines more than 100 kilometers away from that site. And it is affordable given that the IGCC uh, treatment of coal produces so much more electricity per molecule than conventional pulverized coal burning. If we're successful in IGCC in this country, will that be enough? We're not done yet. We believe that the creation of biofuels and the biofuel industry, which apparently you covered in July, is a real possibility. But Shell takes a somewhat different view with respect to biofuels. And that is, we believe the technology is there to concentrate not on ethanol from food stock, but rather ethanol from biomass, other than food-based biomass. In other words, we do not support, although we distribute it, we do not support investments in corn-based or sugar-based ethanol. Instead, we support investments and are spending by the tens of millions of dollars investments in fuel that comes from the corn stalk or straw rather than corn itself or sugar itself. We believe that biomass treated with enzymes or gasified biomass can be a very productive source of future energy supply. And today, we're one of the world's largest distributors of ethanol, much of which does come from corn. We're not opposed to it in principle, but here's the issue. If the oil companies are already accused of high gas prices, the last thing we need from a reputation standpoint is to also be accused of high food prices, which could be the consequence of corn-based ethanol filling up fuel tanks across America instead of fueling our bodies or the bodies of, of, of the food chain, which is part of our daily consumption, such as eggs, 
such as chicken, such as beef. There's plenty of biomass there, and the technology exists to fuel future biofuel needs with that technology. Is that enough? There's more. We believe wind is a viable source of energy for producing electricity, and the good news, ladies and gentlemen, this country has a lot of wind. And you can interpret that in several different ways. But we have wind farms now in seven states, Shell does, ranging from a wind farm we just recently announced in Maui, which displaces the need for the Maui Electric Company to build a pulverized coal uh, 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 electricity plant, to California, to Iowa, and recently we just began construction on a wind turbine farm in Storm Mountain, on Storm Mountain, West Virginia. So across the nation, we can see wind farms growing in size and in application. But that's still not enough. Solar energy also represents an opportunity. Shell recently did sell its silicon photovoltaic cell business to another company because we have moved to a different technology and we're investing our money in the future of solar energy production in something called copper indium deselenide, which we believe is a more efficient and less costly form of electricity production from solar energy. And then something we're very excited about, working in partnership with General Motors. Shell is deeply involved in the development of hydrogen fuel cell technology for future mobility purposes where hydrogen is the primary fuel source and the internal combustion engine is no longer the part of a vehicle. General Motors has in Washington DC in cooperation with Shell a half a dozen or so GM vans which are powered by a fuel cell which is electricity which is enabled by the hydrogen which is purchased from the Shell station on Benning Road, just a few miles from the Capitol, in a normal retail station, in what looks like a normal retail pump. And the neighborhood has accepted that hydrogen storage because we've explained to them and demonstrated to them the safety and the security that is built around the hydrogen storage in that service station. We're doing this for demonstration purposes, but not for reputation purposes. We're doing it to make this a commercial business in the future. It is challenging to convince people that hydrogen storage can be safely done in a retail service station, but it can be. We're demonstrating it. Our goal is to build a chain of service stations on shell uh, forecourts between Washington and New York, between Los Angeles and San Francisco, to demonstrate the viability of a fuel infrastructure that enables hydrogen fuel cell vehicles to become commercial. Three weeks ago, I was in Washington, D.C. at a day-long meeting with three auto companies and five oil companies, all contributing to the fuel cell development that is taking place in our national laboratories. But this is not an overnight solution. This will occur over the course of the next 10, 15, 25 years, where the biggest technical breakthrough that we must achieve is that of hydrogen storage in the automobile. To store enough hydrogen that a person can travel about 300 miles between refills. Consumer studies have demonstrated that less than 300 miles, it's an irritating part of driving that you have to stop too often, which is one of the reasons why we have to get this breakthrough on hydrogen storage in each and every automobile that would be out there. But with this combination of conventional oil and gas, the so-called easy oil and gas, the unconventional oil and gas, from the oil shale, the oil sands, the liquefied natural gas, the coal gasification, the wind, the solar, the biofuels, the hydrogen. Is all of this enough? Two more important developments have to proceed before we can honestly look at one another and say, yes, we can enjoy energy security in the future. And those two areas are among the most challenging and the most difficult and the most chaotic to try to pull together. The first is what about the future of energy efficiency? That is, how much energy input for how much energy output? Energy efficiency in this country 
moves slowly forward, not fast enough to warrant any decrease in the supply chain of energy. The supply chain must continually grow. Is there a point at which energy efficiency investment can change the game on how much energy input yields how much energy output? What do I mean by that? I mean by that that the design criteria that go into the homes that are built, the buildings that are, that are built, the, the offices, the schools, the factories, the mobility transport that we use, the designs that use energy need to change. Now, how do we change that? Do we change that by regulation? Well, that's one possibility, but that's where the chaotic debate begins and seems to end, because every special interest that has to change what they do may take exception to regulation. Is there another form of change? I believe there is. There could be a cultural change a change in which we teach our children and future generations about how precious energy is. And we inculcate in hearts and minds and behaviors a sense of privilege around energy rather than a sense of entitlement for energy. And that privilege changes the way we think about energy and we treat it as a precious resource as we have come to treat water and air as a precious resource, and we protect it, and we take care to use as little as possible in the course of how we go forward. Now, of course, we have this huge infrastructure that already exists, heavily inefficient infrastructure, and that needs to continue to be fueled. And so that's why I said in my introduction, in 20 or 30 years, how much of a dent can we make? But then we get to the next controversial step that needs to be taken, and that is how do we as a society, as a member of the global community, protect and defend ourselves from greenhouse gas emissions that could well be changing our climate and could well be changing the lifestyle that we have come to know and thrive upon as we move forward into the future? We've seen the recent action in California, AB 32. Shell worked very hard with the legislature in California to try to produce a bill that we felt could be a workable bill. At the end, we withdrew our support, not because we didn't agree in principle with where it was going, but the bill as constructed left so much ambiguity as to leave so much uncertainty that it will take a long time to sort out what's really meant by this bill. And we felt that legislatively, it could have been written more tightly. And therefore, we will now go into the rule writing stage, working with the California Assembly to try to help give our points of view on the rule writing that needs to take place. But ladies and gentlemen, let's be serious. If all 50 states decide to do or to regulate greenhouse gas emissions in their own way, in their own wisdom, a company like Shell is handicapped, seriously, because we then have to adjust to 50 different regulatory environments. What Shell would rather see is a national solution, which can fit into a global solution. Shell was at Kyoto when the Kyoto Accords were debated and finally signed. Shell participated in that debate. Around the world, Shell is out working with government not against government, to try to find solutions in the way in which carbon gas, carbon dioxide, et cetera, is managed. We need that in America. And we've said in a number of national forums that we would like to work with the government, with the national government, both sides of the aisle, and the executive branch to figure out what is a national framework in which we can go forward with greenhouse gas management. And that could take many forms but let's have the dialogue that enables us to put something on the table. Now, we appreciate that the White House has put forward some very good initiatives, I mean very good initiatives on greenhouse gases, but we take exception to the fact that they are voluntary, and we do not think that we can make it on a voluntary basis. We think it needs to be more systematic and more regulatory than voluntary. But there's one other aspect 
of this whole text that I've covered today that we must address seriously. And it's part of the cacophony that our nation is having on energy and energy security, a cacophony that doesn't exist in other countries. And by that I mean too many voices saying too many different things. And the reality, ladies and gentlemen, is we do not teach ourselves about energy. We assume energy. We do not teach ourselves about where it comes from, how precious it is, what it does from a lifestyle standpoint, what it means from a social responsibility standpoint. It's Shell's belief that putting energy into the school curricula of America is an important subtext for the future development of energy policy for the nation. There's no time like the present to begin. There are bits and pieces of the energy story that get incorporated into some school systems around the country. We haven't checked all 50 states, but we've checked a number. And it goes from zero discussion of energy to some discussion of energy, but we have yet to find a comprehensive explanation of energy as we find about history, or civics, or social science, or language, or math, or other physical sciences. By teaching our young people about energy, the cacophony of voices can come together into a more coherent form and a more coherent dialogue about what will solve energy security in the future. I close with the simple statement, Shell would like to be in that dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Asking a question at a Friday forum is a privilege of City Club membership. According to Roger, a synonym for, in for question is inquiry. It should be constrained to 30 seconds or less and end with a question mark rather than an ex exclamation point. <laughs> the first question will be asked by our board host, Carla Kelly. Carla is chair of the program committee, which plans each Friday forum and is one of the most important City Club committees. She served as general counsel of the Port of Portland since 2002. By her own example, she believes in strong education. She received her bachelor's, master's, and was a PhD candidate in English literature at the University of Wisconsin. She also graduated magna cum laude from Northwestern School of Law at Lewis and Clark Law School. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you so much, Mr. Hoffmeister, for coming to Portland. I understand that uh, this is part of a 50-city uh, tour that you're on, and you're only a quarter of the way through, so uh, hopefully we'll have some good questions for you. My question has to do with the unconventional oil that you uh, described. If you are a believer in uh, peak oil theory, then we're somewhere near having produced half of the oil and the other half. Uh, a, a lot of it consists of either this unconventional oil uh, that's coming from the tar sands and the, the shale, or it's coming from increasingly dangerous other parts of the world. Uh, you, you spoke of trying to convince Congress to uh, let you produce from that, those unconventional sources, but can you talk a little bit about your approach to the other costs besides just the financial cost of producing from those sources. And what I'm referring to is the amount of scarce water resources that it takes to produce there, the fact that you need a lot of heat, which comes from other fossil fuels and then goes into the atmosphere to produce from those sources, and just the environmental damage of the mining that goes along with it. Thank you. It is a challenging uh, task ahead of us to demonstrate to the satisfaction of regulatory authorities, state officials, officials in the Department of the Interior, that the environmental issues around the development of unconventional oil can be managed, including water, air, energy use, etc. Also, not to be uh, ignored, are the religious sites that exist in the western part of Colorado in which we have engaged shaman locally to try to point out to us where are the religious sites that we need to preserve. All of these things we believe are manageable. And we believe that the power generation sources 
particularly whether it's use of IGCC technology, can go a long way towards meeting the energy requirements, or, and I, I say this quite uh, in, in, in anticipation of how the technology evolves, it is quite possible that the natural gas that is produced from the heating of the oil shale can be a supplementary source of energy for the production. But in the end of the day, we have a responsibility as a socially responsible company to come up with a business plan and a business model, environmentally responsible business plan that would be approved by the authorities. We think it's possible. We saw it done in Canada, and we believe that the same can be done in the United States, but not without a full public debate over it. Thank you, Mr. Hoffmeister. I'm Leslie Carlson, City Club member. My question to you is about the future of Shell in what may be a severely carbon-constrained world. There are people who believe that regulation of carbon will become so severe due to the effects of global warming that we're already experiencing that oil companies as a model will become obsolete. To what extent are you doing any long-term planning in terms of transforming your company into a new renewable energy company rather than relying on oil for the long term? Thank you. We started 10 years ago with a scenario planning exercise which took us into the renewables business in the first place. In 1997, Shell announced uh, in, to the analysts who hold our shares that we are getting in, and to the public media, that we're getting into the renewables business, which at the time included wind, solar, forestry, biomass. Uh, we've continued to evolve that business. We're now almost 10 years in. We've spent a billion dollars. Um, we'll probably spend, uh, that was just in the last five years, I'm sorry, we, we spent a billion dollars. We'll probably spend another billion over the next five years on these renewable alternatives. Um, when we announced this, we said we are also reconsidering who we are. And we redefined ourselves as an energy company and as a mobility company. So that regardless of the fuel source, we believe we can take our competencies and while for the immediate future and probably the mid and long term future, oil and gas will be a big part of it, even in a carbon constrained world. Uh, we also are developing the technologies and the competence to continue to support mobility and to continue to support energy in whatever form that may be. Ray Polanyi, a City Club member. Uh, obviously, you and Shell are serious about energy efficiency. Uh, what is your position on public transportation, local and national? Much of Shell's base of operations uh, is in Europe. In fact, Shell is registered in the UK as a public company, and it has its headquarters in the Netherlands. I had the pleasure of living there for eight years. I think Europe is a model of public transportation. And Shell and public transportation live side by side very comfortably, in which mobility is, is determined differently in Europe, where public transportation is considered a part and parcel of community infrastructure. And if the truth be known, Shell is the largest tax collector in Europe. We have the largest market share in Europe, generally speaking, and we are a big tax collector because fuel taxes on gasoline products, as we all know, are quite significant in Europe compared to the United States. And so we hand over these taxes to the governments, much of which is then used for public infrastructure. So we believe that there's harmony in both. And, and we believe that the both can live side by side. Um, and, and, and in the end, it's a question of what is the government's policy? And our job is to figure out how to work within the government's policy. Steve Novick, City Club member. Mr. Hoffmeister, you talked about changing the culture. It's my understanding that the residents of Manhattan are the most energy efficient in America. Dense development, mass transit, small apartments. We recently passed a ballot measure in Oregon, which the effect of which is to encourage sprawl. Big houses spread out all over the place, hard to use mass transit. Would you agree that the fight against sprawl is part of the fight for energy independence? Um, I think the I'm just going to react, if I may, to the word energy inde independence, because I do think that independence is a fraught policy. I think interdependence, 
is, is probably a, a more useful policy approach for the nation. I think this is really a question for government and the people who elect the government to decide. An oil company like Shell may have a view, but our view is really to support whatever government policy exists. Uh, we, we want to be in the debate and in the dialogue on government policy setting, but as a corporate citizen, not as someone who says this is the way it must be, but as a, as a corporate citizen that says here are the possibilities, here's what could happen. I do think that uh, I just can only reflect on my personal lifestyle where um, I, I think having lived most of the last 10 years in high-rise living, it's a livable way of life. And, and the farm that we have in Pennsylvania, we may one day live on it, we don't know that. But it's really for the purpose of restoration. And we're taking this farm from an industrial dairy farm to an organic uh, uh, agricultural, uh, sustainable agriculture farm. And, and so we're doing something to give back to what we've enjoyed in life, to this natural preserve. But I do, in the end, think that government has to decide this. And this is where the cacophony of voices in America are better if they are better informed. And this is, you know, so this again gets down to the education principle that we talked about earlier. Rick Williams, City Club member. Thank you for the review of your renewables. Oregon Innovation Council has designated wave energy conversion as Oregon's next emerging industry. Would Shell Renewables be interested in adding wave energy to your portfolio? At this point, I don't think so. And the reason for that is we are fully occupied with the competencies that we have and are, are continuing to further. And you may notice I didn't say anything about hydro power or anything about nuclear power. Shell has defined itself in the portfolio that we have today, and that is keeping us very busy. It's not that we aren't interested. It's that we do not think that we have competence that we can add to, uh, at, at this stage, add to any kind of development. We did take a look at it a few years ago, um, but it's not something that we know enough about to make a business decision. Ted Gleichman, City Club member. Uh, I hope that the weather stays stable for your organic cows in Pennsylvania, but I was surprised at how tepid your endorsement of global warming was. Uh, do you not accept the overwhelming preponderance of responsible scientific opinion at this point in history that global warming will cause serious human effects? Thank you. You reminded me that I left an important line out of my speech. And the line with respect to greenhouse gases is that for Shell, the debate's over. The debate's over for two reasons. When 90% or more of the world's leaders say it's time to get on with solutions, who are we to say otherwise? And secondly, we are persuaded by the science that we're not going to debate the science any further because there is enough evidence out there. So if I sounded tepid, let me reinsert the line that I dropped from my speech to say, for us, for Shell, the debate is over. Let's move to solutions. And that's what I'm implied with the national framework for greenhouse gas management. Thank you so much, Mr. Hoffmeister, for coming. My name is Brian Steensma. I'm a City Club member. Um, basically, I um, just wanted to ask you your perspective from uh, the industry data. It seems that spare capacity globally, including the wellheads, rigs, pipelines, and refineries, is very low or has disappeared. Uh, moreover, we know back from 1979 a testimony by the owner, previous owners of Aramco on a staff report on Saudi oil to the Committee on Foreign Relations in the United States Senate, there existed about 110 uh, billion barrels of proven reserves by SEC standards, and that 93% of this production comes from just four fields. Uh, today, the Saudis have produced about half of this original amount. And then within eight years, that amount doubled to 260 billion barrels and has remained constant at that level for about 20 years now. Sir, by acknowledging the drastic and imminent changes that need to be made in order to ensure future energy supply in the United States, uh, and as a leader in the global energy industry, are you willing to help lead the way for future data, data energy data transparency and reform, specifically by helping to implement field-by-field -field quarterly production levels um, of proven reserves and annual and production? We have the, okay, you ended the question. Excuse me for the heavy, sour question, sir. I think right. it's really important. I appreciate it. Well, I think the, um, um, the Twilight in the Desert book by Matthew Simmons uh, goes a long way towards describing that author's view of the situation in Saudi Arabia. 
and he's taken quite a negative, quite a contrarian view to what others have experienced in working with Saudi Arabia. One of the aspects of the oil industry is that while it is global in the respect to the market, so the market is global, the production of oil is national. And the laws of each nation govern the national manner in which each country operates. Shell is a corporate citizen of every country in which it operates. We follow the laws, the customs, the practices of each country in which we operate, with one exception, and that is in reserves recognition, where proven reserves, because we are a publicly listed company in the United States selling shares here, we must follow SEC rules and regulations worldwide. But generally, as you go around the world, you find each country, for its own reasons, sets its own laws. So with respect to transparency or reporting, we really are the subject of the laws of many nations. And, and, and we may have a view about that, but we really need to express that in each nation. Thank you. My name is uh, Lawrence Wolf. I'm a member of the City Club. I'm also a professor of engineering. And when people talk about the global, or the, let's say the hydrogen economy, as you did, uh, I always have this question, and that is, where will these large sources of hydrogen come from? Will they come from electrolysis? And if it's electrolysis, what will be the source driving that electrolysis? Thank you. Very, very good question. And it's one that we work on every day. We have a laboratory in Amsterdam in which we are producing hydrogen through electrolysis. The source of electricity for that electrolysis process is carbon-based. Other hydrogen comes directly from hydrocarbons, which is a fossil fuel. The goal that we've articulated for our renewables business is to advance the, the electrolysis process to commercial scale while seeking an electricity source that is less carbon intensive, such as uh, integrated gas combined cycle with sequestering of CO2, for example. We believe that there are ways both research, development, and commercialization will drive us towards a hydrogen economy, not in the next five or 10 years, unfortunately, sir, but perhaps over the next 50 to 100 years, which will achieve a hydrogen fuel source for the world, which is essentially, or mostly, carbon free. That's a dream, that's an aspiration, but we're beginning the processes to hopefully set that in motion. We take a very long view in our company we think that that is the appropriate thing to do, and, and we continue to work at it. It's one of the other aspects of our industry which is so critical to the success. When people ask about the future of the energy business and what will it take for the energy business to be successful, I usually say to the audience, we're doing very well in financial capital. The capital markets of the world like our shares. We do very well in the capital markets. We do very well in generating a profit stream through our business model, which enables us to finance most of what we need to do without government assistance. We're also very good in, in, uh, in our technologies. Our technologies have advanced over the last hundred years to where we can withstand hurricanes with no leakage from the seafloor because we have shut-in valves which operate to shut in uh, oil flow during hurricanes when we abandon the platforms in the outer continental shelf. We have other technologies which are advancing the environmentally responsible production of oil and gas. But we are lacking one area of future development which we can all do something about. And in this country in particular, we are lacking the human capital to take us to the next 50-year cycle. We have seen a reduction in the teaching or the learning of math and science. Our engineering schools are stretched very thinly to provide the quality and the quantity of engineering and, and geoscience talent that will support an industry like ours looking into the future. The number of graduates coming out of universities who have studied and who are equipped with the skills necessary to take research and development to the next level is a shrinking population in a relative sense. In an absolute sense, there are still thousands of graduates graduating. But in a relative sense, given the growth and the size and the demand for future talent, we believe that there, we are facing a human capital crunch. We're also at a demographic changeover in our industry. 
where the successes of the 60s and the 70s and the early 80s led to a dramatic decline in oil investment in the middle 80s through really the early 2000s, during which time the energy industry, shame on us, did not invest full well in the development of talent. And so we're facing what's called a crew change in the industry, where the average age of our workforce has reached a point where we now have to hire dramatic numbers of people to replace those who are retiring and keep up with growth. This human capacity issue that we face is one that's very serious and one that we are working on steadily by investing in math and science in education curriculas, promoting teacher collaboratives to build skills in teaching math and science, promoting scholarships uh, in, in a whole range of, of schools and universities. We'll get there, but it is a limitation at the moment as we speak. But thank you for that question on, on electrolysis. We are optimistic that we can get there but a lot of hard work between now and then. Thank you, and that was not a planted question. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Sandra Walden, I'm not yet a member, but soon will be. And I think that um, you may have answered my question, but I, I agree with you and thank you for um, confirming that we don't pay enough attention to educating about energy. My question was, what is Shell doing or willing to do to um, provide support for development of curriculum or, or supporting the schools? And maybe you would want to add to that and hopefully take another question. Thank you. We, we have uh, um, tried to put our money where our aspirations are. And so our social investment spending is largely directed towards a category of what we call workforce development. And this is working closely with the American Petroleum Institute, where other companies participate as well, but concentrating at the middle school and the, jun uh, the junior high school and the senior high school level on math and science teaching skills. This is where we find we catch them or lose them in terms of their life choices, having sufficient math and science to go forward. Uh, we also work with many universities. Shell has identified some 23 strategic universities to work closely with. Uh, to see to it that we are closely engaged in the curricula, in the support of the university, in support of research and development. We wish it could be more, but there's only so much we can do. And, and there are so many other good universities out there, but the ones we've chosen we're working very closely with. These are, are very important issues for, t for today and for tomorrow. We all also you know, t talked about the need for curricula development, and that is a newer uh, uh, idea that we still have work to do before we have a concrete set of plans on how that might go forward. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a real pleasure to be with you today. If you would like, we are having a town hall this evening at the Marriott in which we have invited quite a number of members of the community to come talk with us about the issues that we face in energy because we're here not just to speak, we are also here to listen. So please feel free to join us between 5.30 and 7.30 this evening, if you can, over at the Marriott. Thank you very much. John, thank you very much for a wonderfully informative presentation. We are adjourned. <laughs>